A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindu Newspaper Analysis brought to you by Shankar AAS Academy for the date 1st of February 2023. And displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. See, as we all know, yesterday, economic survey for the year 2022 to 2023 was released and a lot of articles today will be based on the economic survey only. Now, without any delay, let's get into the articles discussion. Today, let us start our discussion with this front page news article. The news article contains some of the key points mentioned in the economic survey 2022-23. It also includes some of the snippets taken from the chief economic advisor's speech yesterday. So, in this discussion, we'll try to see the important points given in this news article. Firstly, the Economic Survey of India says that Indian economy's growth rate is going to be at 6.5 percentage for the fiscal year 2023 to 2024, and it has said that the growth for the current fiscal year, that is the 2022 to 23 it is at the 7 percentage and the chief economic advisor of india yesterday in his speech cited that the economic recovery in india has finally concluded this he said after seeing the economic growth given in the economic survey of india he is of opinion that india from now on need not worry about the recovery and push forward to attain an increased rate of growth This is because India has already attained the recovery. Now look at this graph here. The graph shows the real growth percentage of India. As I said already, after a slump created by the COVID in the growth percentage in the year 2020, India was able to maintain a growth percentage of over 5 in the years 2021 and 2022. So this is the dip rate because of the COVID, and after that, more or less, India has maintained the growth rate of five. Now moving on to the next graph, this gives information about the inflation rate in India from January 2021 to December 2022, and from this graph, we can see that there is a huge inflationary trend in India for most part of the years in 2021 and 2022. See both the consumer price index and the wholesale price index has remained high during this period but as you can see both of them started to spiral downwards towards the end of the last year see the survey says that it expects the inflation to remain under the upper threshold for the year 2023 here note that the upper limit of cpi is 6 percentage and monetary policy committee of rbi through which monetary policy tries to keep down the inflation in our country below this particular level that is below 6 percentage now what do you think was the average inflation rate of last year see the average inflation recorded in india for the year 2022 was 6.8 percentage from this what we can say the inflation rate is 0.8 percentage higher than the upper limit but there is a silver lining here because the survey said that this 6.8 percentage is not high enough to deter the private consumption which means that even though price of some goods were slightly higher people in india did not stop their consumption since the consumption in india never weakened there was an inducement to the private companies to invest further into the economy and this only has ultimately resulted in a good growth percentage for indian economy so till now we have seen about the growth rate of indian economy and also about the inflationary trend in india for the past few years now let's move on to see about the current account deficit of india see lately india has been experiencing a slow down in the exports at the same time there has been an increase in imports of goods into india and because of the combined effect of these two india is running a current account deficit see when imports is more than exports then current account deficit will happen if you want to know more about current account deficit you can watch our 19th of january 2023 hindu news analysis okay now coming back see running a current account deficit is not good for an economy India has a high current account deficit because of its huge value of import of crude oil. 
and according to the economic survey if india can maintain its current account deficit within a range of 3 percentage of its gdp then it will be in a good position see one of the major drawback of having a high current account deficit is depreciation of rupee it means the value of rupee will keep on decreasing so india needs to make sure that exports from the country are increasing to maintain a manageable level of current account deficit and this is all about the information about current account deficit given in the economic survey now further the survey stresses the need for increasing the spending on infrastructure here note that increasing infrastructure has huge multiplier effects on the economy other than this fiscal consolidation and encouraging women employment are the areas in which the government of india has to stress upon according to the economic survey here the term fiscal consolidation refers to a policy action which results in the reduction of fiscal deficit of the government now that's all for this discussion in this discussion we saw some facts given in the economic survey that is given in the article we saw about growth rate we saw about the inflationary trend we saw about current account deficit and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the steps to be taken by the government of india now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now look at this article here it says that as per the economic survey startups are being envisioned as the spine of new india this is because startups have encouraged youth to become job creators rather than the job seekers as per the survey india has emerged as one of the most vibrant destinations for the startup ecosystems see the country now has more than 84000 recognized startups and this is the crux of the news article given here see what we saw just now is the information given in the economic survey but in this discussion we'll see about the basics we'll see what is the definition for startups in india see there are certain conditions to be filled to be considered as startups in india the first condition is that the entity should be incorporated as a private limited company or it should be registered as a partnership firm or a limited liability partnership in india secondly it should not have completed 10 years from the date of registration and the third condition is that the turnover of the entity should not exceed 100 crore rupees for any of the financial years since registration and the fourth condition is that entity should be working towards innovation development or improvement of products or processes or services or the entity should be a scalable business model with the high potential of employment generation or wealth creation and the final condition is that the entity should not be formed by splitting up or by reconstructing an existing business and if the entity comes under any of these conditions then it is considered as a startup in india see if an entity fits under this criteria they can register themselves as startup under the startup india scheme under the scheme eligible companies can get recognized as startups by the dpiit here dpiit is the department for promotion of industry and internal trade See if the entities are recognized by DPIIT as startups then they can avail some benefits and what are all the benefits that can be availed by the entities which are recognized as startups by DPIIT some of the benefits include relaxed norms tax benefits that is tax exemption easier compliance access to funding like the mudra scheme IPR tracking and easy exit Now that's all regarding this article. In this article we saw about the information given about the startups in the economic survey and after that we saw definition of startups in India and finally we ended our discussion by seeing some of the benefits that can be availed by startups which are recognized as startups by DPIIT. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this editorial article it talks about the economic survey that was released yesterday the author of the article criticized the document saying that it looks like a report card on the government's performance and he also says that some parts of the survey looks like bjp election manifesto now you may wonder 
then how should a survey be you'll get the answer for it during the course of the discussion but before that kindly go through the syllabus that i have highlighted here for your reference now we'll start from the basics what is an economic survey see the economic survey is a detailed report on the state of national economy in a particular financial year that is coming to a close see now we are in february which means we just have one month before the end of the financial year 2022 to 2023 and the next financial year begins on april 1st 2023 and since this financial year is going to end we have to know how the economy has performed in the last year before we prepare ourselves for the next financial year now why is this document so significant see the economic survey gives a detailed account of the inflation rate the trends in key segments such as industry infrastructure agriculture foreign exchange reserves and so on and it also mentions the possible economic challenges that india might face in future and suggests measures to overcome them so it basically acts as a platform for suggestions and ideas for the upcoming economic policies and discussions and this is one another reason why the author is so enraged see he feels that the document is a dry compilation of data to substantiate the government's economic performance he says that economic surveys in the past had put out various ideas like for example the idea of universal basic income put forward by the 2016-17 economic survey see many ideas and suggestions were not well researched policy ideas but at least they triggered a debate and forced the policy influences to think about these issues but according to the author The economic survey of 2022 to 23 did not provoke any such discussion. So here I'll get you through some highlights of the survey before seeing the critical view of the author. See the economic survey says that India's GDP growth is expected to remain robust in financial year 2023 at 7 percentage. And it also says that India would remain as the fastest growing major economy. and the gdp forecast for financial year 2023 to 24 will be in the range of 6 to 6.8 percentage the survey projects a baseline gdp growth of 11 percentage in the nominal terms and according to the survey credit growth to the msme sector has been high over 30.5 percentage on average in the previous year and the survey raises a caution about the depreciating rupee and also the survey talks about the current account deficit and it said that current account deficit may continue to widen because the commodity prices remain high around the world and according to the survey the electronics exports have risen nearly threefold and the government's finances have shown a good performance in this financial year and then the survey says that there has been enhanced lending by the financial institutions due to their clean balance sheets brought by the efforts of the government and further the economic survey highlights that credit disbursed by non banking financial companies have been on the rise now talking about the social sector the survey says that the sector has witnessed significant increase in the government spending and then the survey talks about the recovery of the labor markets which suffered highly due to the pandemic and further the economic survey says that the year 2022 saw improvement in the gross enrollment ratios in schools and improvement in gender parity and then the private investment in agriculture has risen to 9.3 percentage in 2020-21 and another major highlight is that the service sector is expected to grow at 9.1 percentage in fiscal year 2023 as per the survey See these are some of the highlights of the economic survey 2022 to 2023. See these points they may seem a little overloading. It contains only of data, right? But these data only gives you a picture of how the Indian economy has performed in the last fiscal year. And this is also one another concern of the author because the author says that economic survey just contains only data of the government's performance and it does not contain any ideas or suggestions for the future year see i have given here the important points in the economic survey you also go and read the economic survey and take note of the other points that i have missed here 
Now with this note, we'll try to understand why the author of this article sharply criticizes the survey. Like I said already, firstly, he says that the economic survey has only data points and these points seek to portray a good image of the government's economic management and it blames the previous regime for all of its ill measures. And then he says that the survey has projected both the GST and the corporate tax cuts of the 2019 as a great move. See, GST and corporate tax cut means reduction in the amount paid as taxes. Okay. See, according to the author, this is a misguided information. See, although GST regime has improved the tax buoyancy, there are some disadvantages associated with it. But instead of discussing the disadvantages associated with it, the survey has projected that both GST tax and corporate tax cuts of 2019 as great moves. And this is the second criticism of the author. And thirdly, he says that an analytical discussion on the employment intensity of contemporary economic growth models and ideas to boost the job creation is missing in the survey. So according to the author, Contemporary economic growth models and ideas to boost the job creation is not given in the survey. And finally, the manufacturing gross value ordered grew only at 4% even before pandemic hit. And here the economic survey blames it on corporate indigestion from too much debt accumulated during the previous regime. And these are all some of the criticisms of the author regarding the survey. However, the author also says that survey had some new and interesting data regarding housing market, digital infrastructure, etc. And putting out such large amounts of economic data in the public domain is itself is a good effort to be appreciated. And while concluding, the author says that economic survey is the only medium in the country for a rigorous, thoughtful discussion of new economic ideas. Therefore, he is saying that it should be a doctoral thesis on the economic roadmap to trigger discussion in the public sphere. So, what is the author doing here? He is not blaming the economic survey. He is just saying that what are all should be there in the survey so that Indian economy can benefit from it. So, that is all for this article. In this discussion, we saw about what is economic survey, its significance and we saw some of the key highlights of the economic survey 2022 to 2023 and uh, after that we saw some of the criticisms of the author regarding economic survey and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the author's idea of how the economic survey should be. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this article here it talks about the growth potential of electronic vehicle industry in India. According to the economic survey, it is estimated that India will be producing at least 1 crore units of electric vehicles before the year 2030. And subsequently, this particular industry will also be generating 5 crore new jobs. Here note that Government of India has previously enhanced the budgetary allocation under the faster adoption and manufacturing of EVs scheme. And this is only famously known as FAME. See, this has been done to aid the growth of electric vehicles industry in India. As you all know, there is a huge uproar among the world countries opposing the usage of fossil energy based vehicles. And this opposition is due to the global warming potential. So, to move away from this fossil energy based mode of transport to clean based mode of transport, production of electric vehicles becomes important and this is why there is a huge demand for electronic vehicles around the globe. And considering this situation only, Indian government has increased the budgetary support towards this particular industry that is the electric vehicle industry. See the economic survey which was released yesterday says that the budgetary sum was raised to 10,000 crore under phase 2 of fame from only 895 crore in phase 1. See, as I already said, the budgetary sum has been raised significantly from phase 1 to phase 2, considering the situation in the global market. We saw why adoption of electric vehicles is important, right? Because use of fossil energy based vehicles, they are harming the environment and they are contributing to the global warming. 
and considering this only india has increased the budgetary support see the increase in allocation is very huge nearly 11 times the money allocated to the ev industry in india has been increased in the second phase of the fame scheme and this is all about this small article given here see this article is very important because it has information about the electric vehicle industry that is given in the economic survey take note of it and use this point in your mains answer wherever it is relevant okay in this discussion we saw about electric vehicle industry in india the information given in economic survey we saw why adoption of electric vehicle is significant and what is the budgetary support of india towards the fame scheme that is the faster adoption and manufacturing of electric vehicles now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now look at this editorial article here it talks about solar energy india is currently very enthusiastic about the climate change agenda and is fully embracing solar energy now such a change is timely but unrealistic see most of the time we see editorials which suggest fast adaptation to solar power but differently this article talks about why india should not give up on large hydropower and coal projects see i have taken this article today for our discussion because while writing an answer you should know all perspectives right you cannot just support solar energy and write your points what if the question is asked like critically analyze so at that time you have to write both advantages and disadvantages right so in this discussion we'll see what the author has given regarding large hydropower projects and coal projects and the adaptation to solar power but before that the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here please go through it now let's start with what are all the applications of solar energy see solar power or solar energy is the energy from sun see solar energy converts heat energy from the sun into thermal energy or electrical energy see the heat to electricity conversion is done using photovoltaic cells remember solar energy is the most readily available and free source of energy and it is one of the cleanest and most abundant renewable energy sources available so to sum it up solar energy is a free energy which is renewable reliable and it reduces the utility cost now moving on solar energy can be classified into two categories and these categories are based upon the mode of conversion and type of energy it is converted into see the types passive solar energy and active solar energy belong to the mode of conversion and they can be converted into solar thermal energy and photovoltaic solar power and concentrating solar power see here passive solar energy refers to trapping the sun's energy without using mechanical devices you are just trapping the sun's energy and converting the heat into thermal power and the active solar energy uses mechanical devices to collect store and distribute energy now look at this image here it will help you understand what is passive solar system and what is active solar system now coming to the next category solar thermal energy see it means the energy that is obtained by converting solar energy into heat and the photovoltaic solar power it is the energy obtained by converting solar energy into electricity on the other hand concentrating solar power is a type of thermal energy used to generate solar power electricity and these are all the different types of solar energy so despite all such advantages the author of this editorial tells that the solar energy is not the best option for india and there is a prevailing misconception that the cost of power generated through solar energy is coming down and it is close to the cost utilized by coal see here there are two flaws the first flaw is the place where both are compared see solar power and coal electricity they are incorrectly compared at the load center rather than at the pit head where the costs are half as high here load center is used in the residential and light commercial applications to distribute electricity supplied by the utility company throughout the home to feed all the branch circuits so this is where load center is 
in the residential and light commercial applications and the pit head is the entrance to coal mine we all know that moving electricity through high voltage wires is cheaper than moving coal right so comparing the solar power and cold electricity at the point of distribution will show false figures and it gives us an illusion that the power cost of both the solar power and the coal electricity are equal so the author of the editorial is saying that if we are going to compare solar power and coal electricity we should not do it at the point of distribution rather he is suggesting that we should do it at the point of entrance this means that we should weigh in factors like how coal is harvested and converted to electricity how solar energy is harvested the equipments used for it the cost of harvesting and how it is converted to electricity and this is the first flaw secondly the author is saying that we should compare like with like have you heard about people using apples and oranges see this phrase is used when some people compare two entirely different things and this is what author is also saying here he is saying that like things should be compared with other like things See solar electricity is intermittent and coal electricity is continuous. So how can we compare these two? And while calculating the cost, we have to add the cost of storage by battery. But it is left out which also shows that the cost of solar power is almost near to the cost of coal generated electricity. We all know battery is used in the case of solar electricity, right? Like I already said coal electricity is continuous it can be generated all the time but solar electricity is not like that it can be generated only when sun is available so the author is saying that we cannot compare these two itself in the first place so the author is saying that solar energy is made financially viable to misguide people and it is done by omitting the cost of storage batteries and inhibiting the sector with great proportion of government subsidies and concession and in some cases the government has forced the solar energy adoption on the industry and discoms through state policy but in reality the program is making slow progress so these are all some of the points mentioned in the article by the author and so far we have seen about the reasons for the misconception about the solar energy now we shall see why we should not give up on the large hydropower and coal projects see india and china appear to be in competition with one another for the production of more renewable energy and this competition is encouraged by the west as well and most importantly we have huge potential to produce more renewable energy in hydropower which is both least expensive and most carbon efficient for example US have used 90% of its hydro potential whereas Europe have used 98% of its hydro potentials but India it has only utilized about 15% of its hydro potential so utilization of these hydro power appears to be a measure of civilizational evolution and development See in the case of China it also supports renewable energy but it has not given up on the coal and hydro power I'll give you an example the largest hydroelectric project in the world is the three gorges project in China's Yangtze river so to conclude we should support large hydro power projects in India why we should do this because it has huge potential to produce renewable energy and it is least expensive and most carbon efficient now that's all for this discussion in this discussion we saw about solar energy its application its uh, different categories and we saw why solar energy is not the best option for india we saw the two flaws in comparing solar power with the coal electricity and finally we ended our discussion by seeing why india should not give up on hydro power projects Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now look at these two articles the first article the industry steady recovery chapter in the economic survey has a small part dedicated to the ship building industry and this article is explained in that context now look at this news article 
it reiterates the points related to education from the chapter social infrastructure and employment big tent now we'll understand what these articles say about shipbuilding industry and education sector and some important points in the economic survey firstly we'll see about the shipbuilding industry see the shipbuilding industry is a strategically important industry due to its role in energy security national defense and the development of heavy engineering industry and the shipbuilding industry also has the potential to strengthen the mission of atmanirbhar bharat and because of these significances as per the economic survey it is imperative to invest in the shipbuilding industry here marginal consumption to gdp ratio is important i'll tell you what it is as of now we'll take a number as an assumption for this ratio okay we are going to take 0.45 as the marginal consumption to gdp ratio for the shipbuilding sector see this value is nothing but the change in the consumption with respect to change in gdp so this ratio indicates how consumption is changed with respect to change in gdp okay now with this figure we can calculate the investment multiplier which is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus 0.45 that is 1 minus marginal consumption to gdp ratio see this investment multiplier gives the value of 1.82 so what is the significance of this investment multiplier i'll tell you with an example see if we are going to invest an amount of 1.5 lakh crore in the naval shipbuilding project then we can get an amount of 1.5 lakh crore into 1.82 is equal to 2.73 lakh crore in the shipbuilding sector see how the investment is multiplied right we are investing 1.5 lakh crore and after the investment multiplier effect it has given 2.73 lakh crore in the shipbuilding sector and this is due to this multiplier effect so again quoting this marginal consumption to gdp ratio the economic survey is saying that it is imperative to invest in the shipbuilding sector see many actions have been taken in this regard the survey says that indigenization initiatives implemented by the indian navy have resulted in a significant infusion of economic activity and this economic activity is triggered by creating employment opportunities for micro medium and small enterprises and other industries because if we are going to indigenize our products then obviously we are creating employment opportunities right for instance the recently commissioned aircraft carrier ins vikrant engaged approximately 500 msmes 12000 employees from ancillary industries and 2000 shipyard employees see how indigenization initiatives linking many sectors like msmes and other ancillary industries and how they are creating employment right and besides benefiting the ancillary industries and creating massive employment opportunities the indigenous shipbuilding industry can also reduce the freight bills and foreign exchange reserve outgo see if we are building our ships here itself then we will use products from the domestic manufacturers right and this will obviously reduce the import bill which in turn will reduce the spending of the foreign exchange reserves what will happen if the import bill is less it will reduce the current account deficit so due to all of these reasons strong forward and backward linkages of the shipbuilding sector play an important part in the creation of self reliant india and this is about the first article now we'll see what the second article says see the budgetary allocation for education has dropped over the past 7 years it has dropped from 10.4 percentage to 9.5 percentage as per the economic survey and the other important information about the education sector given in the economic survey is about the school dropout rates In the year 2019-20 the total dropout rate in primary school was 1.5 percentage which fell to 0.8 percentage in 2020 to 2021 but it rose back again to 1.5 percentage in 2021 to 2022 then in the upper primary classes the dropout rate fell from 2.6 percentage in 2019 to 2020 
to 2.3 percentage the following year but it rose to 3 percentage in 2021 to 2022 and as far as higher education is concerned the number of medical colleges in the country increased from 387 in 2014 to 648 in the year 2022 and the number of mbbs seats have increased from 51348 to 96077 and according to the survey the number of indian institutes of technology rose from 16 to 23 between the years 2014 and 2022 overall in 2014 there were 723 universities in the country and the number has now increased to 1113 and the next part is about the total enrollment see as per the survey the total enrollment in higher education has increased to nearly 4.1 crore in financial year 2022 2021 So since 2014-15 there has been an increase of around 21 percentage in enrollment but the sad part here is that the share of education reduced from 42.8 percentage to 35.5 percentage between the fiscal years 2015-16 and 2022-23 and this is according to the budgetary documents see the reduction in the education sector is a result of higher spending on health and other measures due to covid-19 pandemic and this is the reason cited by the survey for the reduction of budgetary allocation to education now that's all for these two articles here in this article we saw about the ship building industry its significance and the marginal consumption to gdp ratio and how it is utilized for increasing investment in the ship building sector and after that we moved on to see about the actions taken by the government in this regard and finally we ended our discussion by seeing some of the education related information given in the economic survey now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now look at this article here this is about the pharma industry in india see the pharma industry or pharma sector is very important for any country particularly its importance is felt by all countries in the world during the pandemic Here in this discussion we are also going to concentrate on information about pharma sector of India that is given in the economic survey see in the economic survey 2022 to 2023 it is said that india's domestic pharmaceutical market was estimated at 41 billion dollars in the year 2021 but now it is likely to touch 130 billion dollars by the year 2030 and this information is only given in the title of the article see as per the survey india's pharmaceutical industry was ranked the third worldwide and it is in the terms of production of pharma products by volume and india's pharmaceutical industry was ranked 14th by value see in terms of production by volume it was ranked third and in the terms of value it was ranked 14th See Indian pharmaceutical industry was the largest provider of generic medicines globally. It has a 20% share in the global supply by volume. And apart from this, Indian pharma industry is regarded as a vaccine maker with a market share of 60% globally. See we made Covaxin, Zykov D and many more. See we did not just make it we also supplied to other countries which were in need of vaccine during the pandemic see these are all the informations about the pharma sector of india in the economic survey 2022 to 2023 apart from this the survey has also given information about the growth in the industry see as per the survey the pharma exports made a healthy growth of 24% in the financial year 2021 and this growth is attributed to the covid-19 induced demand for critical drugs and other supplies and the exports are made to around 150 countries based on the demand and as per the survey the exports remained robust in 2022 also despite the global trade disruptions and a drop in demand for the covid related treatments see the survey cites two reasons for this growth one is the investor friendly policies and a positive outlook for the pharma industry in india and due to this 
foreign direct investment in the pharma sector crossed the 20 billion dollar mark by september 2022 and the second reason is that government had taken several steps to improve the infrastructural facilities for the pharma sector some of them include scheme for strengthening of pharmaceuticals industry spi protection linked incentive scheme for pharmaceuticals etc now that's all for this article discussion in this discussion we saw about the significance of the pharmaceutical industry and we saw some of the information given in the economic survey 2022 to 2023 about the india's domestic pharmaceutical market and after that we saw about the growth in the pharma industry and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the reasons for the growth in the pharma industry now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now look at this article here what is the title of this article see out of pocket health spending is nothing but the money spent by the individuals or the households in the hospitals that is at the time of receiving health care imagine that someone is having fever then what they will do they'll go to the hospital and consult the doctor right and at that time they will pay the doctor fee and the money for the medicines no and this is only the out of pocket health spending this expenditure is incurred by the individuals or the households right and they are taking it out of their pocket and giving it to the doctors or the hospital facility and according to the survey this out of pocket expenditure is still high despite the contribution of the government see generally out of pocket health expense increases in two cases one is when services are not provided free of cost through a government health facility then the out of pocket health spending will increase and the second case is that when an individual is not covered under any public or private insurance or any social protection scheme then the out of pocket health spending will increase and these are the two cases where out of pocket health spending will increase but look at this graph no this graph shows the government health expenditure and the out of pocket expenditure as a share of total health expenditure now if you can see this graph you can easily understand that the government's contribution in the health sector has significantly increased from 2013-14 in the fiscal year 2018-19 and all the gap has reduced significantly right See for the year 2018-19 India's total health expenditure was estimated at 596440 crores and moreover the government is providing the largest cashless health insurance scheme can you guess what it is yes Aishman Bharat Jan Aarogya Yojana but despite all these measures the out of pocket health spending is still high see as you can see the government health expenditure for the year 2018-19 is 40.6 percentage of the total expenditure while the out of pocket expenditure remained higher at 48.2 percentage so what is the reason for this see the aishman bharat jan aarogya yojana targeted approximately 50 crore beneficiaries but as per the survey only 21.9 crore beneficiaries have been verified including 3 crore beneficiaries verified using state it systems see this is less than 50 percentage of the targeted 50 crore beneficiaries under the scheme right and this is the main reason so what should be done here the health insurance scheme of the government should be promoted well and it should be taken to the nook and corner of the country secondly the reason for the higher out of pocket expenditure is reduced budgetary allocation see it has been recommended several times that the government's health expenditure should be raised from the existing 1.2 percentage to 2.5 percentage of the gdp by the year 2025 so this increased budgetary allocation should be ensured now that's all for this article in this article we saw about what is out of pocket spending and what are all the reasons for the higher out of pocket health expense we saw the government's contribution and we saw the government's cashless health insurance scheme and finally we ended our discussion by seeing what should be done to reduce the out of pocket health expenditure now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now let us take this article for our discussion see yesterday 
The Madras High Court ruled that the Kula certificates issued by private bodies are invalid in law. So, if a Muslim woman need a Kula certificate, then she has to approach only the family courts and not any self-declared private bodies such as Shariat Council. Here, Kula means divers and the Shariat Council are nothing but a private body which consists of a few members of the Jamaat. See, this is the crux of the news article given here. Here, we are not going to see about the issue or the certificate or about the council. But in this discussion, we are going to see a few facts about the family courts. See, family courts are specialized courts that were established under the Family Courts Act 1984. See, this was enacted with a view to promote conciliation and secure speedy settlement of disputes relating to marriage and family affairs and for the related matters. See, the primary goal of the family courts is to preserve the welfare of the family by using a multidisciplinary strategy to resolve family issues within the framework of the law. Secondly, it was also established to remove family and marital disputes from the overburdened and traditional courts of law and place them in a simple court where a lay person could understand the procedure. So basically, the two pillars upon which the entire structure of family courts is built are counselling and conciliation. Now talking about the appointment of judges to the family courts. See, the state government may with the concurrence of the high court appoint one or more persons to be the judge or judges of a family court. Now remember, these courts work in a pattern where on one hand individuals legal rights are protected and on the other hand they serve as a guide, helper and counsellor to help families deal with the problems and restore family harmony. So basically these courts perform two roles. One is protection of the legal rights of the individuals and the other one is providing counselling to the families to deal with problems and restoring harmony. See, sometimes all these cannot be done by family courts alone, right? In some scenarios, they need the help of other institutions or other experts. And that is exactly why the state government can provide the family court, institutions or organizations engaged in social welfare, persons professionally engaged in promoting the welfare of the family, persons working in the field of social welfare, and any other person whose association with the family court would enable the family court to exercise its function or jurisdiction more effectively in accordance with the act. So the state government may provide these institutions or these people to help the family court. Now finally, before concluding this discussion, let us see some of the unique features of the family court. Firstly, family courts are free to evolve their own rules of procedure. That is, it can override the rules of procedure contemplated under the Code of Civil Procedure. See, this is because they are built upon the principles of counselling and conciliation. Sometimes, the terms of conciliation cannot be brought under the existing legal law, right? And that is exactly why they are free to evolve their own rules of procedure. Secondly, the cases are kept away from the formal legal system. This is because the experience of a formal legal system can be very traumatic experience for the families and it may lead to personal and financial losses which will have a devastating effect on human relations. See, whenever a matter is resolved by an agreement between the two parties, then it will reduce the chances of any further conflict, right? And that is exactly why Family courts give more emphasis on settling the disputes by mediation and conciliation. And the third important feature is their method of working. See, the actual proceedings before the family court are first referred to conciliation. And only when the conciliation proceedings fail to resolve the issue successfully, the matter will be taken up for trial by the court. Here the conciliators are professionals who are appointed by the court. And without the express permission of the court, a party is not entitled to be represented by a lawyer as well. And this is the third unique feature. And finally, once a final order is passed, the aggrieved party has an option of filing an appeal before the High Court. And these are all some of the features of the Family Court. Now with this, we have also come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about 
the establishment of family courts its objectives and after that we saw about the appointment of judges we saw about the working of family court and finally we ended our discussion by seeing some of the unique features of family court now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion so today we have three prelims questions i will solve two of them and one of them is a quiz question for you now let us take this first question consider the following statements statement 1 the total number of universities in the country has remained the same in the last 10 years see from our discussion we know that statement 1 is incorrect we saw that in 2014 there were 723 universities but now the number has increased to 1113 statement 2 India has achieved the milestone of 6% of GDP spending on education last year. See this statement is also incorrect. In 2021 to 22, the budgetary allocation for education spending by the union government and the states combined was far less at 3.1% of the country's GDP. And this large gap between the 6% target and the actual status of investment has remained for many decades now. So no India has not achieved the milestone of 6% of GDP spending on education. So the correct answer to this question is option D neither one nor two. Now moving on to the second question consider the following statements with reference to family courts. Statement 1 the setting up of family courts and their functioning comes under the purview of state governments in consultation with their respective high courts. See this statement is correct. the setting up of family courts and their functioning comes under the jurisdiction of state government and they consult with their respective high court for this matter statement 2 these courts are governed under the state legislation see this statement is incorrect family courts act 1984 was enacted by center and it only governs the family courts Recently Lok Sabha has passed the Family Courts Amendment Bill 2022 to establish family courts in Himachal Pradesh and in Nagaland. So these courts are governed under the central legislation. Now moving on to the final question, see aspirants, this is only the quiz question for you. Read the question carefully, think about it for a minute and post your answer in the comment section. See aspirants I have given here the mains practice questions so if you are interested write it and post your answer in the comment section and if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today post that also in the comment section and with this we have come to the end if you find the video useful like share and comment and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel for further updates thank you